Hello my soccer universe, let's put a bow on the 23-24 club season by summarizing the six leagues that I've not made dedicated summary videos of, which is of course the Austrian Bundesliga, which you can find up here, and I also made one for Serie A, which are the two main leagues that I'm interested in. However, there are other leagues that I've been making at the beginning of the season, sometime a long form video, but mostly I've done short form videos. I'm gonna continue that a little bit more towards the end of this video as well. Now, I'm wearing Pauk. I'm not talking about the Greek League all that often, but first of all, I'm really happy that Pauk became Greek champions, but I want to give it also a Greek touch because Olympiakos is a non-top six league team that won actually the Conference League. I think it has been quite a while since a non-top six league team won a European trophy. So, Congratulations to Olympiakos, but we should never forget Pauk were actually the Greek champions. Now, in this video, I am gonna go through these six leagues. We'll first talk about any playoffs that were being played. Most of them were promotion slash relegation playoffs. However, at one league even had a conference league playoff that I wanna mention briefly. Then we look at the overall summary of the season. Uh, you know, who's going Champions League, Europa League, Conference League, who's getting relegated, who's getting promoted, although we talked about that before. And then we look also at the relative performance, which is how many points did you make as compared to the expected points pre-season based on the rating that I'm using? So who outperformed their own performances a lot will get a very positive rating and the other way around a very negative rating. Let's get started with the promotion picture in England where we already knew that in the championship Leicester City has won it and Ipswich Town, the sensation of the season, two promotions in a row are back in the Premier League. That meant that two of the relegated teams in Leeds United and Southampton needed to dig it out for the last promotion spot. Leeds were the favorites overall, however, in the final at Wembley, uh, Armstrong goal sent Leeds through a Leeds team that never really showed up. So yeah, the game was not a good one to watch. So if we summarize now uh, what was happening in the Premier League, of course, City were the champions. Um, it was a three-way title race for the longest of time and this made the Premier League probably the most watched league this season. There's no doubt about that. Um, however, then early April there was this one weekend where Arsenal lost to Villa at home and also Liverpool lost to Crystal Palace at home. And at that point it was all in City's hand and City did not let up. It's every year the same story. If you give them a chance and the end of the season they just win, 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 win. However, this season they seemed flawed. It was not a great season and it was uh, underlined that they only won this title. Although it was the fourth title in a row which never has been done before, but this was not the City from the last season. Arsenal really kept up with City, probably all outperformed their own expectations. I mean, last season they had a long lead and then uh, fell off. This time they kept right up with it. If it was down to head to hand between the top three teams, Arsenal would have won the league. They even won the goal difference battle. So everything was falling in place except you dropped points at crucial times in the season. And you know, you can pick it out. Either it was the Aston Villa game, the Fulham game, whatever. Just was not enough still. And this just tells you what a juggernaut CD is. But Arsenal was probably the most entertaining team to watch. Liverpool probably had the biggest story with Jurgen Klopp announcing that he's going to step down. And then he had the whole melancholy hanging over Anfield. Liverpool at times played really well and seemed like a title contender. However, there were some weird refereeing decisions going on. So yeah, um, Liverpool season ended a little bit on a bum note because we all thought that everyone will play for Klopp and he will end it with a title. No, this was not, no, not to be. At least he got one title. That was the League Cup that he won with a glorified reserve squad against Chelsea at Wembley, which probably was one of the sweetest triumphs in his career. And then, of course, there's Villa, the surprise package of the, of the season. Despite having European commitments, they always played on top. Una Emery doing an amazing job there as well. They beat most of the big boys at home as well. They gave them a good run. Uh, they played some exciting stuff. They fully deserve their fourth place in the Champions League next season, which is also great because this is a former club that has won the European Cup. So Villa, definitely a highlight of the season. Spurs looked really good at the beginning of the season, playing the, the very attractive style by Ange Postecoglou. 
However, it got tired at the end, similar to Villa, they ran out of steam and Manchester United season is salvaged by a great FA Cup run that included some of the best games that we've seen this season, it's namely the 4-3 over Liverpool, but also the crazy semi-final where they should have probably lost to Coventry City, won on penalties, and then they actually deserved to win over City because they took their chances, something which Dortmund did not do uh, in the Champions League final and so United salvage a rather down season because in the league yes it's injury but there's a whole lot more that did not go right with Manchester United and then there's Chelsea that was a mid-table lower mid-table team even, even at times really up and down there's some great performance in there. I think it was a 4-4 against City a great 4-3 win over United uh, but then there were also some really dour performances like the 5-0 thrashing by Arsenal for instance but at the end they actually stitched something together and it looked like this team is growing and uh, that Pochettino has found a way only for Pochettino stepped down which was really really weird highlight of the season surely is Cole Palmer being a top scorer with 22 goals I think relegated the uh, three promoted teams from last season Sheffield United Burnley and Luton Burnley really disappointing Luton almost made it we already talked about the three promoted teams. Another big story in there was, of course, the PSR rulings with Everton and Nottingham Forest were handed points penalties, which in the end did not matter. Everton actually outperformed their own expectations. They could have finished a whole lot higher. I mean, give them 10 points and they're almost there uh, ahead of Crystal Palace. So this tells you that Everton, maybe they're not attractive, but maybe there might be something growing. But if we look at the bars, if we sort them on the right, who's the best team? It's Arsenal. Arsenal is the best performing team of the season. Aston Villa is in second place. Bournemouth, another great story in there as well, because Bournemouth under Iraola did not start well, but then it got going and they were one of the most attractive teams to watch. We had Liverpool, we had, of course, Spurs, Everton, as I said, and City. Uh, on the bottom, uh, you see your Lutons, although we didn't expect much from, from Luton. Newcastle, also injuries. They uh, had the Champions League but then it kind of went flat United really not good Brighton also not living up to its Brentford almost got relegated to be honest and then Burnley and Sheffield United I just want to put one last touch on there and mention Crystal Palace under Oliver Glasner yes overall the season maybe was not so successful but at the end they were the most entertaining team to watch and maybe there's a bright future for Palace as well that might lift them into Europe let's see about that Annoyingly, the Spanish league season is not over yet because they are the play of the promotion playoffs for the third promotion spot. Still outstanding is this classic uh, Segunda División, uh, which you know I'll mention probably when I preview the La Liga season for uh, the 24-25 season. However, we know already that Leganes have won the Segunda and Real Valladolid actually first secured promotion. However, on the last day they were probably celebrating too much lost it so they gave a first place but I'm really happy that Valladolid are back. The La Liga season was one that was really hard for me to get into uh, but I would say there were three teams that this season was mostly about three positive teams let's put it that way. Of course the champions Real Madrid you win another Champions League you win the league and let's say it, even though Girona more on them in just a bit were pushing them for about half of, of, of the season once Girona kind of was stumbling and once they beat Girona at home for nil there was only one champion and was cruising to that no other team got close uh, it was a comfortable league win for Real Madrid without being too convincing and that was same can be said for the Champions League win as well but that outstanding again for Real Madrid um, we had Barcelona in second, a very top turvy season, and that they finish in second, I have to say, does not uh, tell a good story about La Liga. I think this Barcelona team, in most other leagues, that are a little bit more competitive, um, would not have finished in second place. Girona is the other really, really good story. It's a team that you expect it to be lower mid-table. They're in the Champions League. They were pushing Real Madrid for a while. I think at the halfway point of the season they had around 50 points, which is amazing. Absolute amazing run. Yes, let the part of the season it fell a little bit flat. 
They still have with Artem Dovbik, the top scorer of the Liga, the Pichichi. That was also a very exciting race uh, for that trophy because it involved none of the big stars. You had Dovbik, you had Serloth from Villarreal. Uh, Villarreal had a very, really bad season, but that uh, scored over 20 goals without a penalty. And then you also had a former last player, then Ante Budimir, uh, who also for Sasuna was scoring goals quite wildly. So this was uh, the fun part. But going back to Girona, uh, highlights of their season include some of the most entertaining games. I mean, especially first half of the season, you had to watch Girona because they were scoring wildly. Uh, they had a 4-2 away win in the, at the Montjuic uh, for, uh, against Barcelona. They beat Barcelona at home 4-2 as well. So despite finishing behind Barcelona, but they had to head the clearly won against Barcelona and then of course a crazy 4-3 win over Atletico Madrid there were just a few of the highlights. Girona it's not a fairy tale story in the sense you know City Group and, and so on but it's still a really really good story overall. Atletico Madrid make it to the Champions League which also I think that La Liga has great names in terms of close, but it lacks a little bit depth because Atletico Madrid also had a very bad season. They should not be in the Champions League, but they are. The third team that actually uh, really excited me was Athletic Club. Uh, earlier this year, they played some of the best football ever in La Liga. They won the Copa del Rey. Great run where I think they eliminated Barcelona. They eliminated Atletico Madrid. The final against Real Mallorca was already a little bit flat, but once they got the first title in over 40 years, they could celebrate wildly. And then I guess the push for the Champions League was not that important anymore. You got a trophy. This was more important than probably Champions League. Uh, their rivals are also still had a really good Champions League season in the fall, but then the season kind of fell flat. Europa League next season, also not too bad. And Real Betis, I don't know how they managed to get again into Europe because this was a team that I found rather flawed. I actually would have uh, thought that Valencia had overall a much better season. Even Alaves, I mean, had a really good season. Uh, when it goes for rele relegation and illusion teams, Granada, Almeria, Cadiz, although I have to say Almeria did not win for a long time and they had a long streak where they didn't get, get a win. They always play a little bit better. Granada were clearly the worst team in that league, so it's actually fitting that they finish bottom. Cadiz were hanging hang on, but in the end, yeah. Did not work out for them. If we sort it, it's Girona, 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 but again, Bilbao, Real Madrid, Alaves as a promoted side did really well. Las Palmas also had a really good start to the season. And as I said, Valencia, Barcelona, yeah, probably have um, a little bit dissed them too much. I mean, there's some great young talent growing there. It's just that the whole strategy of the club seems to be a mess to me. But, you know, if you hold on to your Yamin Lamals and your Kubar Cs and, you know, if you get Pedri and Gavi back on track and maybe don't play them too much and let them develop, I think there's a future there. But if you go out for the All-Stars and so on, Real Madrid, who just got Kylian Mbappé, will probably be the dominant force in the Liga. On the bottom, Sevilla. Sevilla. Yeah, another... It, if you're from Andalusia and you're not Betis, you did not have a good season. And Sevilla barely uh, stayed in the league. It was relegation threatened for, for a while. Uh, there's a lot of infighting within the club and so on. It's just a mess. Going to Germany, I have a little tip for you. At the end of the season, don't say that the season is over unless you've watched the Relegation, which is the relegation slash promotion playoff between the 16th team from the Bundesliga and the 13th from the second Bundesliga. This always delivers. There are some crazy scorelines in there. None crazier than what was this season. Fortuna Düsseldorf, a team that finished third and actually if the season would have gone on, probably would have uh, managed the second or first spot. They really played great stuff. Very, very offensive. They seem to be very much on the roll versus uh, Bochum. but just about re avoiding relegation direct re re relegation, but they got called out in the in the first match for Dona Dusseldorf, win 3-0. And even I, who have seen relegation duels, thought this might be too much for Bochum. No, it was not. Kevin Stöger put in a very dominant performance and Bochum win 3-0 in Dusseldorf. And you could see it on, on the face. It was a game that was going back and forth, made a nice video, but it goes to penalties. Where Bochum stay in the Bundesliga. It's absolute madness. Uh, it's also madness that St. Pauli for the first time ever finish ahead of City Rivals, high as far, and then also to add insult to injury, Holstein Kiel, just a little bit north of Hamburg, it's the first team from Schleswig-Holstein to actually be in the Bundesliga. So yeah, the Bundesliga over is still okay, getting smaller because staying with relegation, another big club is being relegated in Köln, a team where I always had, had the feeling they're 
actual performances are much better than the results that they are getting. However, it's their local rivals. It's not really city rivals, but it's all about Leverkusen. I mean, Leverkusen, what they played this season. I don't like Leverkusen that much, but this Leverkusen team was exciting to the nth degree. Uh, very re resourceful, their comebacks, their unbeaten streak, the first Bundesliga team to finish a season unbeaten. And they would have finished an entire season, all competitions unbeaten, if it wasn't for the Europa League final against Atalanta. But there Atalanta showed up and again converted the chances, which is what Dortmund did not do. Should talk about in a sec. But Leverkusen, absolutely amazing season. Xabi Alonso doing an outstanding job. And that team, even when Victor Boniface was then injured, you thought they might fall off. No, it never came. The push from Bayern also never came. Bayern, really disappointing in this array, there was the discontent with the squad, you know, Tuchel is the real six, the holding six, whatever do we need, Kimmich uh, is not my, my player, I need, need, I need someone else, yes, you had Harry Kane scoring goals like crazy, uh, but overall this Bayern team was never clicking, and then they cannot even hold on to second spot, which goes to the other great performer in Stuttgart, Stuttgart, this was a team that just got relegated, they even a better story in a way than Leverkusen. It's just that Leverkusen was all conquering, but the Stuttgart team under um, Sebastian Hoeneß just escaped relegation last season. They played in the relegation and now they finish in the second spot playing together with Leverkusen the best football in the league. Ah, uh, there are some crazy games in there, especially the ones against Le Leverkusen, where they usually were on the short, short, short end. And I think they were really, really, really good to watch as well. Leipzig and Dortmund, both teams, I would say more disappointing, but thanks to Germany having a really good European season, um, they get both into the Champions League. Dortmund actually did it for themselves by going all the way to the final. A final they probably should have won against Real Madrid, but yeah, so this Dortmund season, yeah, we say it's not fish, it's not meat, it's somewhere in, in, in between. You cannot be really happy, especially in the Bundesliga. They showed quite some weaknesses. Frankfurt, a similar story. I would expect more of Frank of, of Frankfurt, you know, after all, Oliver Glasner, you had Top Müller taking over some great performances. But for me, it never felt that they are the sixth best team in the Bundesliga, but they got at least enough points based on the strength of, of the squad. Cannot tell too much about Hoffenheim, except that they, with a late surge, made it into, into Europe for the first time in a few years. Uh, but Heidenheim is one of the true feel good stories. Unlike Girona, this is really a small town club without major support from a major company. With Frank Schmidt for 13 years there, they rose, 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 rose. They made it into the Bundesliga, they made it into Europe, into the Conference League. This has a little of a Union Berlin vibe, except that this is a really small town and a really small team. But they're good enough to finish ahead of giants like Werder Bremen, like Borussia Mönchengladbach or, as I said, Köln, who unfortunately got relegated. If you look at the relative performance, uh, Stuttgart just ahead of Leverkusen. It's just because Stuttgart was really expected to be more in the relegation battle than really pushing for Champions League. But as a Stuttgart sympathizer, I was very happy to see them perform so well. We see also Heidenheim up there, Augsburg the team that I didn't mention, they were in the European picture for a while. They are a perennial relegation candidate and they're perennially escaping them. So never bet again, uh, on Augsburg to get re relegated, Bremen, Hoffenheim, Leipzig, yeah, I think a little bit too high as a feel uh, Bochum, but there are many that have kind of a negative performance. We already said Frankfurt, uh, Bayern, Dortmund, Freiburg also didn't really follow it up that well. Uh, we had your minds is Darmstadt current got relegated, but then Wolfsburg, Gladbach and especially Union Berlin. I mean, this was an Union Berlin side that completely imploded uh, wrong transfers in, in the summer that disbalanced the squad and he had to go of, let go of Urs Fischer. Yep, a season to forget. You almost got relegated. You escaped that one at least. In France, we have the comeback of a giant after two years in the Ligue 2. Saint-Étienne, ten-time French champions, are back thanks to an overtime draw at Metz where they scored in the 117th minute, but you know, it's a team that belongs just into Ligue 1. They join Auxerre, another traditional club in the way we know them from the Champions League in the 90s, and Angers back into Ligue 1. The Ligue 1 season, I have to say, I never got really into it. Uh, part of it is because we all knew the PSG, despite losing Messi, despite losing Neymar. You had Luis Enrique, a good coach in there. You had still the top French line with Mbappé, Dembélé and Colomiani. 
it was clear that PSG will be the class of this league. They really need to have an off season. There was a little bit drama because once Mbappé really announced that he's not gonna can't continue, he played less and less minutes arguably to be uh, safe for the Champions League, but that did not work out as well uh, either. But they end up as double winners without being really convincing, I have to say. But it was behind PSG where there were the real stories. I mean, Monaco re-established themselves a long time in second spot uh, with Adi Hütter at the helm. Um, there was a mid-season vault, but overall Monaco playing some really good stuff. And of course, Brest, that's the best story in Europe. That's the best story in Europe. Similar to Stuttgart, they were a team that you would expect for relegation and they made it into the Champions League. Unlike Stuttgart, who are a massive club in Germany. Brest is a teeny tiny team that never finished in the top half. I have a work colleague from Brest. He's beside himself. They cannot even play in their own stadium in the Champions League. That's as crazy as it gets. Absolutely stunning performance. Little Brest. They were in pushing PSG for a little while and may have been able to finish in second place. At the end, they escaped Lille, who finished now the qualification spot for the Champions League. Uh, nice uh, could have been up there, but they had an, um, a bad ending to the season. And then Faraoli, their coach, who actually got them really high, uh, left for Ajax. Lyon is probably the craziest story of the season. I mean, they had such a bad start. They were bottom of the, off of the table. They went through a whole bunch of coaches and then Pierre Sarge takes over. And in the second half of the season, they were probably the best team in all of France and finish in a very credible sixth spot. So a really bad season for Lyon and actually on a high note, maybe there's a little bum note because they lost the cup final to PSG. And lost, yeah, I think the Champions League was a little bit too, uh, too much, but you know, Conference League, at least you're in Europe, unlike your Marseille and Rennes. Relegated Clermont, Lorient and Metz, thanks to the playoff. If we sort it, we see Brest is the best story ahead of Monaco. Reims is a team I have, no mention Keto Nakamura. Nah, I don't think he had that big of an impact uh, coming coming for us. But yeah, Reims is a team that is also a little bit punching above its weight. Le Havre surviving uh, the first season in Ligue 1 uh, also. And you know, you see Nice Montpellier on the bottom. Of course, they are the big hitters. You know, the teams that were in Europe actually, Rennes, OM, Lens, and Clermont Foot, the worst team in the league. Overall, Ligue 1 had not a bad European season, but exactly the teams that were in Europe then did not perform well in Ligue, Ligue 1. So let's see how a new crop will do next season. Going over to the Netherlands, we actually have to talk about two playoffs. First, the Conference League playoff that got already decided on the past weekend with a big upset. Nijmegen were the favorites. They played an absolute amazing season, made it all the way to the cup final uh, where they lost to Feyenoord. And then they lose the semi-final against the go-ahead Eagles who just made it into this playoff with a last minute winner. And then they have to face Utrecht also away from home. Utrecht had the lead, had plenty of chances. Yes, go-ahead Eagles were well into the game as well. Then there was a late bust up where there was a crazy red card for Utrecht. There were flares being thrown. There was a penalty given for the go-ahead Had Eagles in the 990th minute. Goes to overtime, another goal for Utrecht, is this allowed? Um, yes, I'm not, still not sure if this was really offside. I think there was a touch there, whatever. They score late on and the go-ahead Eagles make the sensation and go into the Conference League playoffs. Whether they will make it through these playoffs, that's a whole different story. Uh, and then we had the relegation playoffs. First of all, the promoted teams, Willem Dwey from the Erste Divisie and Groningen are in there. I have to mention Roda Jezeka Krade, who thought a day uh, before the end of the season, they already got promoted. Then they give up a late equalizer, I think. Then they can still, with a draw at Groningen, their rivals manage to get promoted. Groningen do win. They go into playoffs and are completely annihilated in the first round. That must have hurt. In those playoffs, it's Breda who get out of these. And it's also a crazy one because they're final against Excelsior. Excelsior team that actually went quite nicely over Den Haag. Um, got out of it because there were two red cards given late on that made it from a 3-2 to a 6-2 for Breda. And even winning the return leg 4-1 was not enough because an aggregate uh, Breda win 7-6. That's almost Germany style. But you know, Breda, after having a few tries, are back in the Eredivisie. And Eredivisie is a season that was dominated by PSV, who could have been one of the uh, most talked teams in Europe if they would have kept up their winning streak. I mean, for the first half of the season, they didn't even drop a point. 
then they lose to Nijmegen and then it goes a little bit uh, side sideways but Peter Bosch doing an excellent job after being very much derided in for his work in Germany and also in France now he got his, if you like, revenge. Uh, a really great title with Luc de Jong, probably the outstanding performance. It also has to be said that Feyenoord, the defending champions, were not that bad this season. They were pretty much on the same level. It's just the PSV were absolutely outstanding. Feyenoord lost, win the cup. Then we have Twente making into the Champions League quali qualification. Also quite surprising given uh, the lay of the land in the Netherlands where you know they are the top three. But Ajax had a really, really bad season, finishing in the Europa League qualifying spots after being last in the table for a while, although this was always a little bit deceiving because they had a few games in hand. Uh, Z also uh, making it only into the um, Europa League, they were pushing for a Champions League spot for a while. But Ajax is the real negative story. This was a team Oh, a season absolutely too to forget. You had unrest with the fans, you had a lot of infighting with the club, uh, the leadership wasn't right, bad transfers. Move on. I think it's all there. there we then we had the go at Eagles. We had also Vitesse being uh, re relegated after a long spell in, in, in the area divisie. Got a huge points penalty, they barely finish on post positive points, uh, but they were already re relegated at that point. Volendam and Excelsior add to that. If you look overall, it's still PSV and Fairnot that are on top. Nijmegen, as I said, had a really good season, 20 ahead. The go-ahead Eagles, of course, as well, which probably should even be boosted by them making it to Europe. On the bottom, Volendam, Vitesse, two relegated teams, and Ajax, of course. Ajax! What happened to them? Let's see if Faraoli can turn it around. And finally, Liga Portugal, where I'm going all out with this crazy Braga away jersey that I have. Um, promotion Santa Clara Nacional, two of the island teams, make it back and then in the playoffs, uh, Porto Manage from Liga Portugal lose to Aves, which is kind of a new team from Aves, uh, not the same team, they took, took over another license. In any case, a new name back in Liga Portugal, they win 4-2 on aggregate. Uh, a Liga Portugal season that, while I have ignored it at the beginning a little bit, it had a relatively tight race between the big three, but in Sporting, went to the next level. I saw already that around December and so on that Liga Portugal can be really, really interesting. You saw them at the frequency of my short videos for, uh, for Liga Portugal increase quite significantly, mainly because, you know, in Portugal, I really like sporting because kind of of the big teams, they are a little bit the outsider, but they still have a chance of, of winning and also Austrian teams very often do very well against sporting as well. Sporting in the end get the second title under uh, the current coach and that's a really big feat given that they had to wait almost 20 years uh, between the previous two titles. Uh, Benfica finished then in a relatively safe second spot but it's a season still to, to forget because while they were very imperious in the past season, this season yeah Champions League did not work as they wanted. They thought probably they finished second in, in, the, in the group with uh, Inter and Real Sociedad and Salzburg. Uh, then in the league they fell off behind Sporting, then Europa League got limited by OM. Yeah very very middling overall despite being a second place, but it's not as bad as Porto. Porto really fell off and then salvaged the season with a uh, Tassa win over Sporting, who had already been celebrating their championship. Uh, kudos to Braga, who remained the fourth force in Portugal, but there isn't really not much more in there. Although I think they finished uh, third last, let's see whether we were in the Champions League, but you know, the order was kind of restored, Sporting moving up. And Vitoria actually joining a fifth there also having a very safe fifth spot there. If we look at the overall uh, picture, Sporting of course the champions, Vitoria, Morarens, Braga, Benfica are the good performance. On the bottom we see the Porto teams. Porto, yeah, they're in 11th, uh, but it's not good, good for them. But Boavista had also a really good start to the season and then did not go. And anyway, are the two relegated teams. In Portugal it's very hierarchical if you see these relative standings. So there we go, all of the six leagues fully summarized. Now, as I said at the, at the beginning of, of this video, uh, towards the end of the season, I realized that I cannot keep up the pace where I record, you know, three long form videos all the time. And that's why I've been relying very much on short videos, especially for the six leagues that were in this video, while making a weekly long form video for the Austrian Bundesliga and for Serie A. I want to keep this up exactly this way and then publish for these six leagues only short form videos. However, I'm playing with the idea of taking these shorts every week and packing them into one long form video 
adding the tables that I'm creating anyway and make them one summary video that will post probably Tuesday evening or something like that. Let me know if you like that idea or not, if you have any other idea or the way I should drop this all together, although this would be a shame. In any case, please give me a thumbs up, enjoyed this video, drop a line below on anything that I've been talking in this video, be it my uh, reviews, uh, being the summaries, being what I'm planning to do. And I will surely talk to you soon about more things in my soccer universe. Bye. Hey there, I really hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, here are some videos and playlists that you may enjoy too. Also, please consider subscribing to my channel and hit the little bell icon so you get notified whenever something happens in my soccer universe. And with that, have a wonderful day. Bye.